who actually likes it when video game companies redesign iconic characters? Who out there has thought, you know, I really preferred the nuts and bolts designs for Panjo and Kazooie, they're just better. Needlessly changing what works in an effort to pull in new fans has always been a pretty misguided tactic in my humblest of opinions. Who are these for? Why are they made? Certainly not to appeal to random people who don't care and won't play anyways, right? I get wanting to change a character's look. I really do. If the technology is advancing, then sure, it's to be expected. What I find odd specifically is when the change is sudden and unprompted, which more often than not is the case. Let's take a look at Bomberman. We all know of him. He's a little white man with pink hands and a cube head. But if you were a fan in 2002, you might remember differently. He was much taller and sported this garish round head. You think that's bad? 2006's Bomberman Act Zero was an entirely different beast. This game was rated T for fantasy violence and suggestive themes. Women and children need not apply. The explosions featured in this game would have been enough to make Chernobyl blush. Try explaining this to fans of the original, original Bomberman. I'm pretty sure if you were an Eric and the Floaters fan, you got a credit on your taxes that year. Bomberman's identity crisis would continue to spiral out of control until Konami eventually went back to his original design, more or less. Wow. You're the only one who understands me. You see, it wasn't so bad that one day he was wearing a scarf, it's the fact that nobody was expecting him to do so. He looked fine to me, why were we reinventing the wheel? And look, I don't think he's exactly ugly here either, I actually kind of like the way he looks here. But it's important to note, because the changes made to these iconic characters more often than not end up reverting back after a while. This is sounding all too familiar. In 2014, Sonic and Friends had major updates made to their characters to coincide with the new Sonic Boom era of branding. Much like Bomberman before him, Sonic started wearing a scarf. Sega also boldly went where previously only one of my second grade classmates had gone before. They colored his arms blue instead of tan. Knuckles was now much larger and grew fingers as opposed to his mittens from previous games. Tails came off as more of a handyman with his goggles and tool belt. Amy stretched out a bit and had more of a form-fitting dress. Strangest of all, however, was the fact everyone was wrapped in bandages. I'd argue that the Sonic Boom style wasn't a total waste of effort, there was a pretty noble attempt here to do something cool. These guys had a vision for Sonic that was so radically different than what anyone had been doing up to that point, I was genuinely curious to see what they could have done had Sega let them go all out. Sonic's new blue arms allowed for him to have honest to goodness shoulders instead of the little pot belly with arms sticking out the sides. He was much more expressive this way and felt like a separate entity from the Sonic we all know and love. Now I'll show you. I said the Sonic Sonic's we all know and love. My game. Not him. Come on. No. Go. No. <sighs> Sonic always has the same general game plan when it comes to his appearance. He started off like this and would continue to look like that until Sonic Adventure where he would undergo his first real design change in the form of green eyes and a lankier appearance. They were pretty smart to make him look older over the course of multiple installments. This is usually what separates the design changes that work from the ones that don't. Let's go over some notable examples. This is Crash Bandicoot. He's orange and polygonal, and he would continue to look like that until graphics got good. Well, how did they modernize him, I hear you asking? Well, at first, they simply made a more detailed version of his classic look. It was just the natural progression of things, you know? However, starting with Crash of the Titans, he would slowly start to veer off course. Crash had tattoos now and a less refined coat of fur. It wasn't too different, but it was definitely an odd choice as it seemed like they already had a great model for modern platforms at that time. I'll try to keep this brief, but I have to mention that the box art for Mind Over Mutant utterly vexes me. I get that he's supposed to be zany and wild, but this may have been a leap too far. I'm not quite sure what's going on with his eyes here. The pre-release promo art looked much better in my opinion. Like many of the examples in this video, Crash did eventually revert back to his classic design, starting with his guest appearance in Skylanders of all things. Speaking of which, ironically enough, the same series that revived Crash Bandicoot's iconic look butchered the design of his PlayStation 1 brother Spyro. Skylanders was a Toys to Life series of video games where you could scan said toys and use them to unlock content for your game. Spyro the Dragon was part of the original Skylanders set and was sort of the main attraction at release. 
This would be all well and good if not for the fact Spyro was nearly unrecognizable. His snout was almost non-existent, his little mohawk was all but gone, and his friendly purple eyes were traded out for these much kinder looking red ones. Spyro had been on such a hot streak until that point too, his model never really deviated and would be consistent for most of his pre-Skylanders run. The only time he really changed was when they rebooted the series with the Legend of Spyro trilogy. Spyro actually grew up by the third game and was much more muscular in comparison to other iterations. I really think I think that worked for this trilogy because it was kind of its own thing, and Spyro still looked like Spyro, which is what's important. He was also voiced by Elijah Wood for some reason. Setting that knowledge aside, Spyro did get his own remaster in 2018, where a much more polished version of his classic design was featured. I'm willing to bet that if they do make a new Spyro game, and I do expect this, this model will be used going forward. It's kind of funny how quickly companies will rest on their laurels, not that I'm complaining. Look at how Devil May Cry flip-flopped after the whole DMC 2013 fiasco. Sometimes a character won't even have the luxury of returning the form. It's been pretty quiet since Tiny Kong's appearance in Diddy Kong Racing. DS. I'm pretty sure after Barrel Blast, they just decided to delete her from the Donkey Kong continuity. You know, there's something that's been bothering me since this script started. Why did we allow the Pokemon Company to walk free after this murder? This has to be the only case of a redesign for an iconic character that just stuck. When Pokemon came out, kids would be more likely to recognize Pikachu than Jesus Christ. You're telling me they just up and changed him? He is quite literally half the mouse he used to be. A slimmed down Pikachu is one thing, I, I can just barely accept that. But what if I told you what they have planned next has already been set in motion? The Pokemon Company is slowly preparing us for Pikachu's next evolution. And I'm not talking about Raichu. I'm not even talking about Alolan Raichu. I'm talking about Round Head Pikachu. Tell me why more and more I see this lout adorning official merchandise. This special edition 3DS featured Roundhead Pikachu. Even more unsettling was the camera lens placement. Perhaps the seeds for Nipples Pikachu have been planted as well. Let's Go Pikachu used Roundhead Pikachu on the box art, though the Pokemon company had not the stones to animate him in game. It's just regular old skinny Pikachu. RHP has even been animated multiple times. What's especially sickening is we're all going to welcome him with open arms someday. They were careful to integrate him over the course of several years. This is all just my personal theory, of course, but it's an important example. In comparison to our other subjects, Pikachu is very much an outlier. He never went back on his design changes. He doubled down on them. I don't want it to sound like I hate every video game redesign. There are real glow-ups who deserve some credit. Mega Man X was pretty cool. Um, I like DK, if that's even the same character. I'm not quite sure of the lore there. Pit is probably my favorite redesign ever. If you haven't yet, please go play Kid Icarus Uprising. Almond Celica's redesigns are works of art. Speaking of which, Marth Fire Emblem has been on a steady uphill ascent since his debut appearance. Unlike Sisyphus, Marth simply has not let the rock fall down the hill. He has stayed at its peak. The hair, the outfit, it's all a matter of art style, sure, but that does beg the question of what counts as a redesign. Since we're talking Fire Emblem, let's look at Krom. He's a very popular character, so the mobile game Fire Emblem Heroes releases a ton of different Krom units you can unlock in the game. Should we consider all of these redesigns? They technically are, but I'd argue that these are more so alternate costumes. They don't have any relevant place in the Fire Emblem series aside from being a fun alternate look. They are on the same level as something like this, just a fun little aside. Krom from Tokyo Mirage Sessions, however, is a redesign. Now I'm angry. In context to the game's story, this is the Krom from Fire Emblem Awakening, but he has amnesia and is trying to help the protagonist defeat the bad guys. Why then does Krom look like this? It's seemingly just because they wanted him to. I thought he was going to be possessed or evil in this game, but no, it's just 
how he looks for some reason. Krom isn't the only character who has a crazy design change here, but when normal looking Marth and Tiki are right there, it definitely stands out. And yes, I know that isn't actually Marth, it's Itsuki merging with the Hero King's soul or whatever, but by the logic in this game, he could have looked like literally anything and they still could have said that was Marth. I think we need to sit down and determine definitively what should be considered a redesign. I don't think that character's aging counts as a real redesign. It is one technically, but the context is that they're older, so of course they have to look somewhat different. Leon Kennedy, over the course of the entire Resident Evil franchise, looked different in each iteration. He was aging, getting a bit more rugged by the time 6 came around. Those weren't redesigns, it was just the next iteration of the character. Resident Evil Remake Leon is a redesign, because they went out of their way to modernize him and make him look realistic, instead of keeping the perfect anime man he was before, as sad as that is to say. Would you call Ellie in The Last of Us Part 2 a redesign? I wouldn't. In The Last of Us Part 2, she's older, so her redesign is very much expected. It reflects five more years of surviving a zombie apocalypse. So once again, not a redesign, just a time skip design. Overwatch 2 takes place a year after the first game, and in that time, Mercy got a bob cut. You know, now that I'm looking at it, I'm not even quite sure she cut her hair. It might just be down. Also, Genji isn't naked anymore, and that was crushing for me. He still looks cute, though. I find it funny that they took the time to make redesigns for the Overwatch characters at all. Some are hits, but a lot of them bore me. It takes place only a year in the future, but why not something more significant? It's just silly to me that they put in all this work into making Winston have less lines on his hands. They changed literally every piece of his outfit and it still looks the fucking same. I know they need to keep the silhouettes generally the same to keep the game fun and fair since there's a big competitive scene, but I don't think I'm going to have a hard time distinguishing the giant ape with an electric ray gun from little baby Tracer. This is the same game, mind you, where Roadhog can look like this and this. You're telling me they couldn't have made some of these characters wear a different colored shirt? They act like anyone is going to be using the default costumes. It's laughable. I would have loved to see something really different. As far as I'm concerned, these are just less iconic skins that just took up a lot of dev time. A true time skip design should have a bit more time to be skipped, you know? Not to talk about Fire Emblem again, but when they do time skips, they really get it right. Of course, they are also guilty of, their hair is longer now, but for the most part, I love all of these. I also loved the time skips at the end of Persona 4. Again, these kind of designs don't really change anything about the game, so they don't really count as true redesigns, and definitely aren't hated because of that. Same with Link in Ocarina of Time, he just looks cooler, and it reflects the seven year time skip, without treading on what came before. In fact, I don't think anyone was surprised since it was how we imagined Link would look like in 3D anyways. Speaking of Link, this is an odd subject to discuss and I feel it may divide some opinions, but is Toon Link a redesign? In lists of the craziest redesigns ever, you never see Link among them because he looks different in pretty much every game, right? So if he's never consistent, are any of these the real design? Anything that isn't this could be considered a redesign as far as I'm concerned. Toon Link is obviously much different in comparison to his brothers, but if you think about it, he really doesn't look that different, it's just the art style. Also, these are all technically different people, so maybe none of these should count. So if we're not counting those, what about the Zora? Do these count? I'd suggest you stop typing that comment because yes, I know that they made a distinction between River and Ocean Zora. It says so in Hyrule Historia. So if River Zora looked like this, why was the first appearance of the sexy Zora in Ocarina of Time Zora River? If they didn't make the distinction till later, I think this counts as a redesign that was just eventually written into the lore. Even more confusing, both Zora types appear in the Oracle games, so I guess since at least then this has been the new rule. Weirdly enough, this game was developed by Flagship, not Nintendo, so I think they may have accidentally made permanent lore for the series there. If they're sexier now, I don't care. Speaking of getting sexier, Shulk and Friends certainly had a nice transition from Xenoblade Chronicles on the Wii to the Switch remaster. This model is definitely still based on the same artwork and foundation, but they benefited a lot from the more anime art style that was developed in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Shulk actually appeared in that game as a non-canon DLC character and looks kind of 
off to me. I'm glad by the time Definitive Edition came out that they tweaked them a bit. These aren't so much redesigns as they are just remasters. Products of better hardware. I always see people talk about how ugly Conker's redesign was, but it's not even a redesign, it's just ugly. They got better graphics and lost the charm by trying to make it more realistic. It works for some games, but not for something cartoony like Conker's. Take The Last of Us Remastered Remastered. The Last of Us Part 1 is a remake of the original Last of Us for next-gen hardware. The original didn't look bad by any means. Hell, they already improved it once before. For Naughty Dog, this was just an opportunity to have the first game be on par with the technical masterpiece that is The Last of Us Part 2. Then people cried, and they moaned because Tess didn't look like she should, and the redesigns were ugly, but don't you bring Tess into this! Because they all looked the same. It was just PlayStation 5 graphics, I'd had no idea what they were complaining about. So these were not redesigns, it was just better graphics. So some games simply improve visually between generations, but others make changes that baffle me. I will say that Sony's Spider-Man is a wonderful game. One of my favorites. It's just disappointing that someone decided moving to the PS5 meant changing Peter Parker's face. It's no secret that this was an attempt to make Peter more closely resemble the current Hollywood portrayal by Tom Holland. Before that, Peter was more of an original take. This was an older, more experienced Spider-Man and not based on any previous movie incarnation. The game was a wild success and people really grew attached to this version of the character. Imagine their surprise when the new PlayStation 5 port is announced and the titular man in the spider suit looks nothing like the character you knew before. Also, Tom Holland isn't a bad looking guy, he's just a bit big be faced, all things considered. I think what rubbed people the wrong way was the fact that this felt like a forced attempt to cash in on Tom Holland's popularity. I don't remember seeing anybody praise this decision. It was a pretty unanimous disdain. Some people even say that the focus on making Peter look like the handsome Tom Holland man took away from the emotional scenes in the game. You can judge the scenes for yourself, but I can see where they're coming from. This just goes to show that a character's design can really cement itself into a player's heart. Sudden changes, however small, can create waves of hate that ripple throughout a fanbase. Love them or hate them, it's always a difficult thing to consider as a character designer. Should we adapt our current design or modernize it? Should we reboot or go back to our roots? I think game developers walk a fine line when reinterpreting established characters. We've seen a lot of horror shows, sure, but we've seen a lot of successes as well. The best redesigns are innovative and serve a greater purpose. The latter are without direction or meaning. These misfit designs certainly aren't hurting anyone, but it does bring me great joy to point and laugh. Is that mean? Maybe. But it's funny, so you know what? It's worth it. In this specific instance, you know what? I'm feeling inspired. Who am I to talk down to the minds that brought us this? Could I have done what they did? Well, I've prepared a new King Giorgio mascot redesign in honor of today's video, so here. This is for all of you. Thank you for supporting me all these years. I look forward to our future together. And that's the video. Thank you so much for watching. I'm King Giorgio. Make sure that you subscribe and hit like. I have COVID right now, so recording this was kind of a hassle. It's okay though, because I powered through it and it sounds fine. In the meantime, why don't you try clicking some of the things on screen? There's the subscribe button, which I recommend clicking on if you want to see more of me. So I'm just gonna sit here until you do something. Also, don't forget to join the King Giorgio Discord. Link in the description. Yeah, <laughs>